Welcome to another edition of CHP Talks. Listeners and viewers, we are here with a special guest, a retired Major Russ Cooper, and we're going to be talking about judicial activism and how that is working out in today's context. So Rod, why don't you introduce our special guest for today? Sure. Well, it's a great pleasure to have Russ Cooper with us, uh, Major Russ Cooper. Uh, he is retired from both the Royal Canadian Air Force, Air Canada, and a third career as a Transport Canada flight test pilot delegate. In his military career, he was a decorated CF-18 combat pilot, and he served in several staff positions as director of major capital acquisition projects and the overall coordinator of the Air Force Capital Equipment Program. In the civilian aviation sector, he com complemented service as an international airliner pilot with national responsibilities in the field of post 9-11 civil aviation security before moving on to the flight test and certification of complex sets of avionics equipment sets. Russ resides in the Ottawa region and apart from being a hospital board director and having those responsibilities, he also volunteers as the president and CEO of a national civil liberties advocacy group, the Canadian Citizens for Charter Rights and Freedoms, which is C3RF. I'm sure we're going to hear more about that. And that website can be found at www.canadiancitizens.org. Russ, uh, thank you for joining us today. It's a great pleasure and privilege to have you on the program. Well, thanks very much for inviting me, Rod, uh, Peter. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, today we have an opportunity to really talk about um, two issues that um, are central to our government, to our country, um, in that we've got the your your history and the defense of our country, which is you know right at the center of what government is you know ought to be doing, and also justice. And uh, so both of those things come together in your interests and experience. So uh, that's that's sort of a, a good place for us to start off with. Um, yeah, you've you've taught you've worked in the uh, defense of our country, and we thank you for your service. Um, but now that you retired from that, you're more looking at you know the justice side of things. What what brought you to that point? It's been a kind of a long and meandering journey. Um, but uh, when I was in the military, I was a fighter pilot and I had the um, uh, distinct honor of um, uh, fighting for Canada in the first Persian Gulf War. I was uh, deputy commander of the um, F-18 squadron that's, that rotated into the combat phase. And uh, that, um, that whole experience uh, kind of made me think about a couple of things. And, um, and uh, the Mideast, um, its, um, uh, its culture, um, uh, Got me thinking, and then when I was in Air Canada, I was flying uh, for, for Air Canada during 9-11. Uh, uh, actually, I was on a trip between uh, Quebec City and Toronto uh, International when the, uh, when the whole thing went up. And uh, we were kind of caught unaware as we were airborne at the time, and all of a sudden we couldn't talk to anybody. And then we got clearance to land uh, 100 miles back of Toronto International, which is never, ever, ever done because uh, it's so busy there that... Uh, <clears throat> that you, you never get clearance uh, sometimes until you're right about the, uh, the point of touchdown. So that was very, very odd. <clears throat> and when we got in, we, we found that uh, it was a very unusual situation. We had the uh, aircraft stacked up in all the gates, and it was just chock-a-block with uh, heavy metal. We got into the ready room, and we looked up the TV and saw that the second, uh, I think it was a sand tower coming down. And um, right there, that... Um, kind of got me in, in, into a, a frame of mind where I, I, I took my military background and started uh, uh, doing work for the Air Canada Pilot Association as a, um, as a security um, specialist. I uh, did some um, um, a deep, uh, deep dive on, on the threat uh, to see what I could come up with. And that has kind of stuck with me. And then, and then a little bit later on, back in 2017, early 2017, uh, I saw false narratives, uh, I thought, being propagated by the government in the form of Motion M103, Islamophobia. Uh, so what I know of, um, uh, from my studies of Islam, and uh, uh, I know that there's a, a, a very long and rich tra tradition of history, 1,400 years old, that uh, uh, associated with Islam. 
And I saw some of the things that were coming out of the Motion 103 as M103 as the false narrative. And so I started writing uh, my point of view to uh, get my point of view out uh, to engage in the public square. And that uh, basically uh, is what propagated this whole thing where we have Canadian citizens for Charter Rights and Freedoms. We have 25,000 uh, followers, members right now. Uh, it's really, uh, really caught on. A lot of people are thirsting for knowledge, and I think a lot of people are realizing that there's uh, uh, false narratives being foisted upon them through political correctness or whatever. Uh, but um, it's, um, we see now that it's hit, a, it's hit a hard point here and now where uh, there are so many false narratives coming at us. Um, uh, and people are, um, are trying to deprive us of our freedom of speech to counter these narratives. Uh, that we've got ourselves in a real tizzy night right now. And uh, we're at the point um, uh, right now where we have to wonder if we have free speech at all. So yes. Part and parcel of that uh, segue into uh, judicial activism. Uh, uh, this, this whole uh, uh, situation doesn't just happen overnight. It happens over, uh, over decades. And part of the, uh, uh, what allowed it to happen was uh, our judicial system, judicial activism uh, within, our, uh, within our court systems, which, if you want to trace it back, uh, can you can see a start point with our own Charter of 1982, the uh, Charter of Rights and Freedoms in the uh, Constitution of 1982, uh, because we can see that being used by uh, um, by jurists uh, to put their own spin on um, on laws that come out of our legislative process, uh, laws that are supposed to reflect us as citizens in what is supposed to be a representative government. But we can see now where, in many occasions, uh, these laws are being uh, are being spun to suit uh, 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 various social uh, uh, pieties, social pieties of the day. So, uh, some of these pieties are not traditional in nature, and they're quite um, uh, quite revolutionary, actually. Actually, yeah. and uh, and now we're in the midst of um, uh, seeing this happen on a fairly regular basis, and I think we've seen it last. Oh, excuse me, occur with the uh, uh, federal court decision to uh, disavow the, uh, the Safe for Country Act uh, between the United States and, uh, and Canada. And we've seen that uh, within the past few weeks. Yeah, and yeah. just yeah. bringing back the idea of the false narrative, um, I think that that's really where it gains traction. I mean, you look at uh, a decision like that, um, as opposed to say parliament or the Canadian people in general, would the average member of parliament think that the United States is not a safe third country? Would the average Canadian think that? No, it's this judge who's basically foisting this, this false narrative upon our jurisprudence, right? Um, so I think that gives maybe a bit of a sense as to what, um, what that looks like in everyday uh, life. And Rod, do you want to maybe just touch in just maybe a little bit more on what uh, you wrote about last week, the Safe Third Country and, and that uh, court decision? Yeah, I think these things, uh, when courts become uh, political weapons or become weaponized to uh, enforce a certain type of political correctness and even even uh, to support a partisan initiative, it's quite uh, dangerous for democracy. So this one judge um, basically ruled that uh, an agreement signed with Canada and the United States, uh, Canada's safe third world, or, or third uh, safe third country uh, agreement, um, would mean that people could not just come into our borders and claim refugee status. If they're coming from the United States, they may be a refugee from their home country, but they're supposed to declare themselves as refugees in the first safe country they arrive at. And someone over in the Middle East might think, oh, Canada's a, a nice place to be. Uh, you know, somehow it's easier for me to get to the United States and I can just walk across the border to Canada. And, uh, you know, when, when agreements have been reached after negotiations and considerations taken by governments, and all of a sudden one judge out of 37 million uh, Canadians, one person says, no, nope, uh, I don't like this. And it may be that she just doesn't like Donald Trump and wants to do something to uh, tarnish his image or whatever. Uh, but it certainly is troublesome that uh, one person or even a panel of judges could suddenly uh, change the whole course of Canada. We have, you know, things like abortion on demand, same-sex marriage, uh, euthanasia, all those things are the result of 
court decisions uh, that either a government hides behind and says, oh, we got to do it this way because the courts say so, or the court actually sets a direction and the, and the parliament just, um, you know, in a docile fashion follows along and says, okay, well, <laughs> it's up to the courts. And really, uh, the legislators are supposed to make the laws and the courts are supposed to apply them as they find them written. And so anyway, it's a big concern and uh, you may have a bit more to say about either about the safe third country agreement or about that whole thing about judicial activism, Russ. Well, let's just take a quick example of a guy who's not sort of stood by quietly and Russ you just wrote about him in your most recent update from CTRF um, a lawyer in Toronto Rocky uh, I think Gelati is his last name and uh, Russ do you want to just talk a little bit about him and how he's standing up against some of this some of this stuff well Rocco, uh, Rocco Gelati has got uh, quite the reputation as being a uh, uh, thorn in the uh, establishment side he's uh, you know, he's a constitutional lawyer out of Toronto as you say uh, and he's um, he's very concerned about um, uh, the government and its uh, unbridled power. He calls the government a machine that has to be uh, that has to be rebuffed. Has to be um, citizens have to be protected from it. That's that's his premise where it's coming from. And now he's looking at um, he's taken on a case on behalf of an organization called uh, 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 Canadian Vac or Vaccine Vac Vaccination Vaccine Canada. I think I might have that wrong, and uh, a few other uh, individuals, and he's uh, he's taking the um, all levels of government to task uh, for their uh, for the their their invasive uh, measures when it comes to uh, dealing with with the Wuhan virus crisis, locking down the lockdown strategy, the use of masks. Um, he says that uh, this has all come about uh, without public input, uh, without a, a chance for the public to have their say without any uh, solid science or data backing the decisions that are being made. And he goes on to cite several examples where uh, some of the things that are being proposed are just simply don't work. And so he's pushing back on um, all levels of government. He's, for example, he's, uh, he's in his legal suit, he includes the federal government of Canada, uh, the medical establishment in Canada, including uh, Dr. Tam, the chief medical officer of Canada, uh, the Premier of Ontario, uh, the Ontario Medical Establishment, City of Toronto, John Tory, um, and for good measure, is even he's going against the CBC because he says the CBC is a public institution. It, it has a duty of care when it comes to informing the Canadian public, and he says they're not being uh, not taking that duty um, uh, responsibly, and they're coming treating the public to impartial and biased information. So this is going to be a very interesting court case that stands to rock all of uh, the, uh, the Canadian constitutional fabric as it stands right now, as he is really pushing uh, to get back to what the Constitution really is all about and what was intended by it. And that's a very important word, intended. What did the framers intend in the Constitution? And um, it should be a very interesting case to see unfold tonight. I plan on behalf of C three RF members to follow it as closely as I can. Do you know when the next court uh, uh, appearance is, or when when they'll uh, the next what what's the next step in that process? Oh, he's just he's tabled his uh, submissions. Uh, uh, they, they're all they're all up online. His uh, statement of claim is up online. I have a, a links to it in my latest uh, update. People can take a look at it, and uh, that's where it sits right now. So it's it's new. <clears throat> And it's waiting for further adjudication. Yeah. No, so uh, M103 was the, you know, sort of your, uh, what pushed you into activism. And we're, yes. we're awfully glad that you did take the step. And, and so out of that came the uh, C3RF. Can you say just how that came about, uh, the formation of C3RF? Yeah, it started with... Uh, I, uh, I have some um, acquaintances uh, who are in the activist activist circles, so, um, and um, I, when I saw the uh, the motion come forward, I um, I didn't have any means of publishing uh, anything that I wanted to write. So uh, what I did was I, I wrote a uh, about a, a ten page piece. Uh, 
uh, on the uh, on the motion and what uh, some of its problems were. And uh, to get it up on uh, on the internet, uh, I knew this uh, this one person who uh, uh, runs an organization. I asked her to put uh, my paper up on her website, and she did so. <clears throat> and then I, and then I started writing all the MPs, every, all of them. And uh, you know, referring them to my expertise uh, uh, to take a look at it. And um, out of that, uh, there were initially about ten or so, a dozen people who uh, kind of um, uh, conglomerated around the uh, around the paper, and uh, and we all began talking and discussing. And that's where we had the idea to come up with uh, an advocacy group uh, who's who was charged with educating the Canadian public and trying to dispel some of these myths that are being foisted upon it. And that, uh, that happened to be uh, a C3 or a Canadian Citizens for Charter Rights and Freedoms. And um, it, it, just, um, it just went on from there. We've, we've participated, we've had conferences, we've um, uh, initiated petitions, letter writing campaigns, uh, some of which would have been amazingly successful. Uh, in uh, back in the M103 before it was uh, voted on in March of 2017, uh, we initiated petition drives and letter writing campaigns. And at uh, one point, uh, Brad Trost is is on his Facebook page uh, said he'd never seen anything like it. But they had 900,000 emails uh, wow. deposited to uh, amongst all the MPs in, in Ottawa, and he said he'd never seen anything like it. It's just a uh, record-breaking uh, number of uh, pieces of correspondence from everyday citizens on Motion M103. So, as I said before, there's a huge thirst out there for for factual knowledge, for, uh, you know, the other side of the argument that is that is just never, uh, is never addressed by anybody. Why do you think this Prime Minister has been so... Uh you know, has taken such a promotional approach to Islam and and such a uh, concern, so-called for Islamophobia, which I, I agree with you is is basically a uh, some fake news in this country. But you know, in reality, around the world, it's you know Christians that are are the victims of uh, you know uh, persecution and and that type of thing, and yet. Uh, somehow this Prime Minister and Ikra Khalid and others in his uh, cabinet and caucus have taken upon themselves to put uh, Islam as the suffering uh, persecuted minority and, and to try to get that uh, across. And of course, once, <clears throat> once you can frame yourself as the victim, then anyone else, everyone else is the oppressor, right? And uh, it's a false narrative, but how, why do you think that is the case? Why do you think that particular uh, model is, is uh, being rolled out by this prime minister? I think, I think the answer is in what you said there about um, victimization, Rod. I think um, it seems to me that more and more the path to political power has been, uh, is, is through this, uh, the route of victimization of um, uh, declaring oneself a victim uh, and oppressed by society uh, at large. And uh, this whole process, uh, it, it's almost, it's formulaic, really, is what it is. You, uh, you, you declare yourself a victim, you uh, establish your, yourself with a group. Uh, this group goes forward, um, can't really get done what it needs to do uh, through the parliamentary system and uh, through individual MPs. So it likes to do a little end run into uh, the judicial side of things, and that's where a lot of court cases are uh, are resolved in, in the favor of the, of the victim. And then we have uh, then we have the political side uh, falling in behind uh, the court uh, the court decisions, either out of cowardice or maybe maybe because the uh, they really uh, they really believe in this victim oppressor narrative, and they see that. As a, as a political wedge, and I think there, I think is uh, where we you need to stop and concentrate on on why this is happening. It's I think it's uh, politically advantageous uh, for certain people who are cynical when it comes to politics, when they're not really serious about representative democracy. It's um, it's an easy way out for them to uh, uh, to to have their to attain political power. Uh, through this process of dividing and conquering. 
And we are in the midst of that right now. And it's, um, it, you cannot, uh, it seems you can't look at any, any article in the newspaper or anywhere without it being uh, associated with some sort of a victim narrative. Right. Yeah, it's very much a Marxist uh, idea. And, and, the, and I really like the point that you made about doing an end run around democracy. Um, you know, if somebody runs for parliament with these ideas, um, you know, they, they will get a hearing perhaps in, in an area and, and perhaps if it has enough credence, they will, you know, be elected and be able to take those ideas to Ottawa. Um, but too often we're seeing that the idea is instead being pushed on parliament by the courts and then parliament falls into line. And that's not the way that our democracy is supposed to work. And that's where you know, we've really got to take that point home um, for everyone who's listening and watching. Indeed. The, the, I guess there's a number of topics we want to uh, touch on, and I guess one of them, and I think it relates to this victimization, <clears throat> is the, uh, the LGBT uh, agenda which has advanced, uh, you know, very rapidly over recent years. And that began, you know, uh, well, it didn't begin with the 95 court decision, the Egan decision, but, but that certainly was a, uh, an important step for them in pushing their agenda. And that was a, a court decision that basically uh, had uh, a common law or, uh, you know, a same-sex uh, sp uh, partner treated as a spouse. And that, of course, then the government followed along not too many years later with uh, same-sex marriage as, a, as an official institution. Uh, are there other examples uh, you see with that, uh, Russ? Oh, well, yeah. It's, I, I think that uh, <clears throat> the LGBT movement is kind of the... Uh, uh, is the initial bulwark uh, into uh, into this whole oppressed uh, victim uh, uh, type of politics. I think even before 1995, you're talking about the Egan case, I think. Uh, there was a 1989 case. It was Andrews versus Law Society of British Columbia. It had nothing to do with um, uh, LGBT, but uh, in that particular case, a, uh, a British citizen argued that uh, he was being discriminated against because the Law Society of British Columbia wouldn't wouldn't allow him to join their their enterprise because he was not a Canadian citizen, and um, so uh, they at, at, at the end of the day this court case went through uh, to the uh, Supreme Court and uh, they held uh, that um, uh, that uh, even though he wasn't a citizen the uh, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms could be opened up uh, beyond. It stated uh, equality grounds for discrimination in the, in the equality section, section 15, to uh, to other other factors which could be seen to be a, an, an analogous analogous to um, um, uh, to uh, to sex. Um, the uh, grounds of discrimination, including uh, sex, age, um, uh, and, and the rest of them, as, as cited in section 15. And out of that analogous ruling came the precedent that allowed the courts in 1995, as you say, to change sex in Section 15 to mean sexual orientation. Well, of course, that was not intended uh, by the Constitution, by the framers of the Charter. But here we see an instance where uh, the courts uh, read in to the, uh, to the Charter something that uh, wasn't particularly there, but something that they declared was analogous. And this, this whole thing, kind of represents uh, how the courts look at the Constitution. They don't look at the Constitution and the Charter as things which were, that had original intent uh, that, that needed to be respected. They look at the Charter as something that they call the living tree. Mm -hmm. And the living tree can grow and evolve and uh, it can have branches and it can adjust to the social context of the time. And when you talk about social context, now you see where with social context, you can weave in the victim oppressor narrative. Because if you have a victim group uh, that is very loud and a very squeaky wheel, well, they can appear to be changing the social context. And now, because we have a great, a great horde of silent Canadians who, are, who aren't saying anything, just watching these things pass by and, um, and uh, they don't like what they see, but they're not, they're not 
they don't feel like they want to get out front and talk about it. Well, what you have is you have a social context that is being driven by the loud voices and uh, the so-called victims. And it's these people, these collectives that the courts end up trying to please and do. And we see, we see that. things written, uh, read in to the charter that weren't there. And now we're having to deal with. And, and that 89 uh, d <clears throat> court case may have some relevance to this recent uh, judge uh, throwing out the safe third country agreement because the, the implications of what, uh, what she's saying is that uh, not only Canadian citizens, but anyone who gets their two feet into our borders is okay. entitled to the same protection of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which I don't think was the original intent either, in, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Uh, unless you think differently, but uh, you know, like we we agree that every Canadian citizen should have the same protection of rights and freedoms. Uh, yeah. But Canadian citizens also have responsibilities, right? And someone who just crosses the border, uh, even illegally, why? You know, how how does that person come under the protection of the Canadian Charter? No, it's a uh, it's an expansion of the uh, of the intent of the Charter. And uh, it's it's one that, um, quite frankly, the uh, Canadian court system has com become quite comfortable in uh, in, in expressing and uh, and demonstrating. Um, it's uh, it requires uh, uh, someone to speak out on behalf of the people of Canada who has the the gumption to actually dress down the uh, uh, these judicial activists and. Actually, this is this is why when the uh, charter first came out, when it was formulated, uh, three of the framers, uh, Blakely, uh, Blakely, uh, Lougheed, and Lyon, uh, asserted that uh, there had to be a notwithstanding clause yes. included in the charter because they feared that uh, the way the charter was written, that judicial activists could just uh, take it and run away with it, and that's why we have notwithstanding clause and. Uh, that is one uh, thing that um, our legislators uh, could use to uh, to push back on this activism, this judicial activism. Uh, but outside of uh, very few instances, we don't see po po politicians of that stripe uh, really in, in abundance. We did have um, uh, Doug Ford come out and uh, and, and for the uh, notwithstanding clause uh, when he was dealing with uh, cutting back on the size of Toronto City Council. Uh, and he, he ran into a buzzsaw when he came up with yeah. with, with that question, but he went with it and he won. He did. Yeah. It's that kind of strength of character that we need to see in, uh, from our political leaders uh, if we're going to start addressing these ridiculous uh, narrative, narratives and uh, situations. Uh, yeah, example, thanks. The, big, uh, the one I, that really gets me, and we are talking about conversion therapy previously, is this whole idea of uh, gender identity and expression where, you know, if, if someone uh, thinks uh, they're a unicorn, and then you have to you have to recognize that and call them a unicorn and participate in his or her uh, uh, delusion. And uh, we're seeing that impact children now. Because now uh, it's, uh, it's required that uh, if, if a child comes forward and says, mom or dad, I think I'm the other sex, I, I, I think, um, you know, I... I want to wear dresses now, and the, uh, the the deal now is is that you have to affirm right. uh, that child um, that child uh, child's predilection, and uh, doesn't matter that eighty percent plus of these children, when they grow into mature adults, they grow out of this dysphoria. It doesn't matter; they have to be affirmed when they're that age. And we're we're seeing people, young people, their lives, their bodies destroyed by uh, invasive uh, surgical and, um, and uh, drug uh, therapies. That's uh, absolutely uh, unconscionable. That's well, we... thank you for bringing up those, yeah, those last two points, the notwithstanding clause and uh, conversion therapy and uh, the unconscionable nature of these uh, gender reassignment surgeries. Um, it's, uh, yeah. Child abuse. There, there are a few, very few mm -hmm. politicians who have actually had the courage to call it child abuse, and uh, we definitely uh, would stand with them. And Interesting to see. Uh, I think uh, in a conservative leadership race, the only one I've seen is Derek Sloan. Yeah. 
that actually That's right. Yeah, and it's taken a, a strong actually talk to the issue. Many of these same topics that we've been discussing today, and uh, you know, I give him full full marks. Uh, he has not backed down as uh, he's been attacked in the media, attacked within his own party, <clears throat> but he um, he sticks with uh, the truth, and and so more power to him. If if he does take the leadership, he's certainly going to have his hands full, uh, you know. But anyway, more power to him. He's he's uh, to be much uh, respected for taking these strong stances and not backing down. Yes. Well, thank you both for your contributions for this conversation. Uh, it's been, been very good. We could uh, keep talking, I'm sure, for another hour, but I think it's time to uh, wrap this up. And uh, thank you to everyone who has listened. Um, hope that you've learned something. It's It's been a good uh, time of inf information. And uh, thank you very much again, uh, Major Russ Cooper for your service and to candidate when you were in the forces and now in your activism work. So thanks so much for being with us and talking to us today. Yeah, we really Welcome appreciate to. it. And, uh, you know, keep doing the good work that you're doing at C3RF. Uh, and uh, we'll look forward to hearing more. Uh, and you're doing a lot of writing and, and those writings are, what, what's the website again? On the website, if people want to join us, join the conversation, it's www.canadiancitizens with a S dot org. And uh, you'll see um, I have a number of uh, my updates. Uh, I try to get out a regular update to uh, address issues of the, uh, of the day or of the week. <laughs> I, I always uh, thought, uh, you know, what, how, can I, how can I write so, you know, one, one piece a week? It's, it's crazy. It's, uh, I'll have nothing to talk about. But, uh, <laughs> Every week, I mean, there's like about 14 things to talk about that are going on in the realm of uh, charter rights and freedoms, let me tell you. Very good. Well, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. I really appreciate it, and uh, keep up your good work. Thanks, uh, Rob. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. And uh, thank you all again for listening. We hope that you'll join us again next week for another edition of CHP Talks. God bless you. Bye-bye. Yeah.